Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's episode. Uh, just some things to say as I start off. Feel free to um, comment and ask any question about the talk while I'm giving the talk. I will attend to the chat section. Tonight's episode is titled <clears throat> Holding the Hand of Lost Worlds. And so really, I found myself in a moment, uh, I was walking downtown, this was today actually, I was walking downtown and I saw this old woman who was homeless, and I saw her crying, imagine an old homeless woman crying out, uh, out there, and for a second as I was passing by, there was something, there was something as if like I was walking past something that uh, was being avoided, do you know? And uh, I just look at my pocket and I see all the, you know, the amount of change I have. I just give it to her. And I suddenly realized the incredible amount of battles that various human beings, every human being, every human being, they say, is fighting a battle you cannot see. And so that became really real for me. And I wondered about the human civilization. I was, sit I was stand sitting, um, not sitting, I was standing outside the subway kind of like, uh, <clears throat> in contemplation, wondering the nature of human response to the familiar and to the unfamiliar. That means we help only <clears throat> when we are safe, it appeared to me. Anyways, after that, I, I kind of saw... After I saw um, that lady, I thought about a human civilization where even though there are many people in their inner battles, the civilization could do something, could do something about the inner environments of people. And I wondered what is the most thing that human beings seek? And for a long time, I was looking at it from an intellectual approach, as if there's this complex problem of like resources not enough. And then I realized it's there, the problem stretches deeper that underneath all of human endeavors, there is a requirement for emotional stability. And that we are not just objects that if we move well, that is it. It's, it's the significance of our lives that <clears throat> move us. So with the title of today, tonight's episode, I was thinking of how many worlds on the brink of being lost are there? How many people are there in this world that they are losing their inner battles? And so you see, it's like, imagine there's an external, not imagine, I, I consider this to be the reality, that there is an objective realm and then there's a subjective realm. And the subjective realm, people have not been conditioned and trained to become responsible. On some level, we feel we are elemental beings, and because we are elemental beings, atomic creatures, we are in some sense, it's as if particles are leading to all this uniqueness, <clears throat> and par particles are probabilistic. So, in, in some sense, uh, there is a point of consideration of how much free will does a person have. I imagine you're as you right now, were recruited and put on a battlefield. If they just gave you like a sword and a shield like in medieval times, would you know how to use it? So it's not just about getting a civilization that is resourceful. It's, it's, it's about reaching a point where we recognize, okay, there's hidden layers to every moment. There's hidden layers to everything. And these hidden layers only exist because certain part of the mind is known. That our human existence really is like a light suddenly went on in a room. Somebody turned on the lights. We're like, oh, wow, look at this room. Look at all this design. And then suddenly we come back to the light that's illuminating the whole thing. <clears throat> I know that... A person who does something inefficient can also do something efficient. If the person had a potential to do something that was, okay, let's say considered by the norm bad, 
then the person also had the potential to do the opposite. So it's kind of recognizing that there is strangely a freedom in one's inner realms. And when objectivity doesn't satisfy, we try to adjust our inner realms to the outer realms. When you look at the progression of human beings in history, what has occurred is this constant awareness that it's our inner realm. Right now, even though, as I'm saying, in this current mainstream, I was, I was not taught about a subjective evolution in school. I was not taught about the subjective self. I noticed that there's many things that the world, the many questions that the world has stopped asking because the response in one question, it's like in one branch of knowledge, there was such an advancement that it's, it stopped other branches of knowledge to advance. As if the civilization has chosen, you know, <clears throat> certain eggs to put it, put it in its basket and just continue, you know. Now, I, I do, I am working on something which is probably going to take me a while to kind of uh, finish, but it's called the Pillars of Civilization. And it's kind of like, I consider it a sort of magnum opus to my life, where the Pillars of Civilization, are all the values that the human psychology must protect. That means there are some things right now that you as a human being may not understand, may culturally be so foreign to. I'll, I'll give you an example. You see this in Canada. All right. Canada is not is better than most places in the world, but is not the best. And of course, no country is the best. <clears throat> every country has problems, just like every person, you know, has their own relationship problem. <laughs> So, I, even in Canada, there's a thing where, but this is a unique thing you see in Canada, especially. I mean, now, nowadays, everywhere in the world is becoming more globalized. But in Canada, there's a thing where you, for example, I, I've personally experienced this. Like, I, I come from a Persian background. And uh, so, it was as if I kind of saw, for example, like, uh, <laughs> how can I tell you? Just go to a Tim Hortons in Toronto and you'll you'll see the various cultures various people from different walks of life walking in the same room that's the thing that Canada has going for it that the tolerance and the uniqueness because there's something <clears throat> very we cannot avoid globalization this at the same time this doesn't mean we should forget our roots and so really the 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 I, There's sacrifices. There's an opportunity cost to freedom and discipline. Sometimes the more freedom you have, the less discipline you have. Sometimes the more discipline you have, the less freedom you have. It's an opportunity cost, like choosing to drink orange juice or, or apple juice, you know? <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is like the behavior of the human being, once it becomes aware of its inner realms, the subjective realm, how can I tell you, do you touch, do you grab every object you see? Like when you're walking by throughout the day, every object, every rock on the ground, imagine you like rocks. Does that mean you grab every single rock you see? No, you consciously choose. If you're a rock collector, which I was when I was young, <laughs> like really young, like that was my whole like childhood right there, rock collecting. And so I would collect rocks. And it, it's as if you, cho you choose, your choice separates, cherry your, our choices make our life significant and unique. You know, any person who feels in life their character, their inner character has been way hidden. I consider the site, uh, oh man, I'm expanding. <laughs> All right, here, I got to slow down. Let's say we're wondering about human civilization, we're wondering about human beings, we have suddenly reached this realization human beings have an inner realm and an outer realm. The outer realm is objectively oriented, objective survival is its own unique program, you got to listen to the objective program if you want to physically exist here. Do you know? Then we have the sort of inner realm, the subjective program, uh, uh, which is in some sense, I could tell you the most incredible, fascinating thing in the whole point of our lives. Do you know? That means imagine you got to the top of the hill and all, Bill, after four billion years, you're like, whoa, I see it. And then you're like, what's the meaning? And you, you in some sense, how can I tell you? Sometimes Sometimes we are already perfect before we are imperfect. It is that we adopt imperfection. 
What I mean by that, that every child, it's like you tell me, even though children cry, are children born with stress? When you speak to a young child, for example, your cousins and relatives, do you see the young child stressed out? No, it is in a state of ultimate trust. That's why children's imagination is powerful, and this is the secret of the ages, that you, secret of the eons, that you have to understand that honesty <clears throat> is imagination. Any human being on this planet who is not honest, your imagination is on lockdown. Because I'm telling you, you cannot uh, entertain the same show every day. You cannot live as the same character every day. You know, one thing that occurred, of course, I'm... I'm not, uh, on some, uh, in, uh, in some sense, I have no choice other than to look through my eyes. But on another hand, it, it, it's, uh, my eyes are um, um, a member of a civilization that wonders what to do with extinction. So really, the human situation, we may sit in the most comfortable houses, we may even bask in the most comfortable palaces and the most greatest, greatest places on earth, only to realize that heaven is an avoidance of earth. Seldom is this said, that many, many ancient philosophies, many ideas were routes of escapism. Human beings were in more savage, messed up situations, so they wanted to get out of those situations more extremely. Therefore, the, the, the subjective realm was a sort, a sort of rope in, uh, thrown at the last hour. You see, the minds, it, it, it wasn't, uh, you see, it, it, it's kind of like, sometimes I can't tell if I am the whole universe, being in one moment, occurring in one moment, or I am just little old me. You see, reality is so significant that we have been obsessed as, a, uh, as human beings with the content of vision. To wonder about the nature of vision means your own bias has to uh, leave first. That means when I was younger, I had certain beliefs on the world that these were very firm ways I was holding manifestation. Somebody would come and say, it's not like this. I would be like, who are you? Get out of here. Like, <laughs> my mind did not care to see anything more than what it was doing. And it's not that people are selfish. It is that their attentions are narrow. Their life sensitivity, your, your sensitivity in this life has to do with your attention, right? I've spoken to people who have asked me about speech because when, and when I was younger, I, would, I was a very quiet kid, like strangely quiet. Do you know, unless there was something that was ignited outside, like unless something came to me, I would not go to anything. You know, it was strange. I don't know why I had that psychology, you know. <laughs> you know, sometimes you can't, you can't question the handicraft of the cosmos, you know. <laughs> but what it was is it was a sort of silence. Incredible, like many years of my life, it's, it's like this is what happens really to the personalities of people. Sometimes life feeds your personality, it feeds your ego, or it doesn't feed you. And you may never know why. You may see some people in reality succeeding that you may not have an explanation for. They're like, how, how is this, how's this guy? How's this guy succeeding? You know? <laughs> but the thing is that it all has to do with what is in view. Just, just take that sentence in. That a lot of your life, a, a person's life, let me generalize here, a lot of the per human being's life, is response to stimulus. Stuff is happening. Do you know? And for a human being to have an ability to allow the inner vision to extend into the outer, ooh, that's when that's when your mind has moved before your thoughts. That's when you have seen heaven before earth was a concept. <laughs> Now, language is a technology, and the reason I'm treating it as a technology is because when I consider it as a technology, I don't identify with it. That means, if, a, if let's say there's person A and person B. Person B runs to person A and says, person A, I can't believe you're this and that and this and that and this and that, and the worst words are coming out. 
right? As if a machine gun of degradation, yeah, <laughs> degradation, yeah. And person A now has a choice. Person B has come and shouted stuff at person A, literally has thrown language like eggs, <laughs> like water balloons. The person's thrown language at the other person. Now person A looks at person B and he can choose, you know, which many people on this planet do to get to believe, to believe in the new. They're, Person A thinks person A and B are looking are seeing the same thing. So when person B says this to person A, person A is gonna it can get offended. And person A is gonna be like, how dare you put that image? That's not me. Who are you to say this? You know? Person A can confront person B. It becomes a battle of whose voice is defining truth. Many people and a lot of violence on our species is because of this. But when you realize every person is in their own room first. That every human mind, that thing about the inner battle, it means there's inner workings. There's stuff happening in every person's life that you possibly cannot fathom because you do not have their eyes. You know? People may be kind to invite you in their realms. You know, I've had the privilege of <clears throat> certain people kind of... It's strange. It's as if their kindness was, 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 was the soul, their soul of the moment. I don't know how to say that. There's some people you see... That sometimes the greatest, uh, this is something strange, but in, <sighs> imagine two billionaires telling a joke and laughing and two incredibly, you know, the opposite of billionaires kind of people uh, saying a joke and laughing. You see those two who their egos are, I consider billionaires to have crystallized egos. <laughs> That means the dude, the dude didn't just have an ego. The dude's lived with the ego to, and the world has give, rewarded the ego. And because the world has rewarded the ego, the person feels they are that and nothing else. Do you know how many people are acting as empty hammers? What I mean by that, it's like forces of nature. Uh, it's kind of like... the. Uh, <laughs> The two billionaires would, one of them would say the joke and the other would laugh, like the most professional billionaire laugh, you know, like as if like he can't, he can't lose face in front of this other guy, you know. <laughs> but those two, those two on the bottom of the class, of the hierarchy, they tell the joke and they honestly as themselves laugh. Because there's a saying that says when you have nothing to lose, you know, you free, you become free. And a lot of people are going towards many sorts of success because they want to reach a point where they will never lose again. That's the greatest motivation for a lot of sports uh, people who their lives are centered around exercise. It's not a power, it's not extrasensory perception, it's just space. You find a space before language became you. So person A, if he had reached this state, I'm going to get back to that. It would be a state where person A listens to person B and instead of fighting the world reality of person B, person A realizes he's in his own room and this guy's in his own room and this guy has false opinions. So let me ask why he has these opinions. Do you see, instead of two, imagine two warriors endlessly from the beginning of time fighting until one of the warriors is like, yo, why are we fighting? You know? And the other warrior is like, I don't know, our ancestors did it. Should we keep doing it? <laughs> this is how war can stop, guys. This is how war can stop. <laughs> Literally, the grandkids are like, okay, I'm tired of this game. Let's, let's reinvent a new humanity. There's no greater game than to attend to a civilization that has endured 4 billion years and now is on the brink of uh, technological transformation.
We don't have too much time to be in our inner realms as well. This is another thing I would say. Of course, it has to do with the kind of roads that life opens for you, the door, the types of doors. What I mean doors that life opens for you is that a human being can imagine you were suddenly, you were like you got a free pass to the most elite museum in the world. And instead of doing anything in that elite museum, you're just like standing around, not even looking at the various rows of what there is. Okay, that's, that, that's, a, that, that's, a, that's a kind of perfect example for a human being that is just existing. Do you see what I mean? A human being that is just existing is, doesn't care about where they are. Do you see any time in your life where, think of it this way, uh, think of this way that even when you're with people, it's, you're not, a, 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 of, of course you're with, we are with them, but at the same time, you're in a state of mind. And so is the other. And really to be observant of how your mind moves, that's, that's the, it doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> To be honest, there's nothing else after that because beyond language, it's pure experiential navigation. And I, 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 let me say it, it's like a coin flip that after we take, we transition out of this material plane of existence, it's going to become pure experientially oriented. So what that means is after your eyes close, you know, your eyes have opened in this world, when they close uh, and you, in some sense, witness the season finale of your life, you know, <laughs> then there is a potential where the camera is still on, but there is no video. There is no, there is no image. So what would you say about a director that is looking at emptiness through a camera lens? So you would ascribe it to an experiential realm. Now, experience is where this non-duality of the yogic mind comes in. That really, it's not a concept. This is why Zen traditions, many traditions around the world, their most secret kind of answers to teachings is paradoxes. I say playfully, when the, you open Pandora's box, you actually find a paradox. And paradoxes are the gate of heaven. <laughs> I'm not joking. It's really, really that space where you're neither in heaven, neither in hell. You see, you're at the gate. You're at the moment prior to definition and the architecture of subjectivity to come and impose as you. Life is, life is fascinating, but sometimes we forget uh, whose eyes we're meant to look in. You'll notice this, guys. Any moment in your life where there's karmic turbulence, just ask yourself, Whose eyes am I looking in, looking through? And just remember your own eyes. There's no greater teaching. The greatest teaching ever was a mirror. <laughs> I'm serious. A mirror is um, the birth of genius. When a person can become aware of what is here, and the moment they become aware of here, the mind animates a new dynamic where it's like, okay, so I am here, and... He, how can I tell you? It's like, my, in my own experience, it was a moment of suddenly feeling uh, unknown, a strange unknown. So imagine like you, you're walking in a, um, imagine like a sudden phone ring, a ringtone, right? But <laughs> this is the worst divine metaphor, but it, it felt like a sudden sound, a sudden occurrence, a sudden subtlety. If they ask, what is the greatest teacher of knowledge, I will say the unknown. I will say that a person can sit and put, dedicate their whole life in designing the most perfect thing, but eventually it's, it, it's, it's the unknown that decides. Now the unknown, if the, if the creature is, cannot uh, handle emptiness, existential emptiness, is not going to want to confront the unknown. Is, does not want, like, think about the strength of the difference between the being that acknowledges, all right, 
there's extinction, there's inevitability. Any moment the breath can uh, become part of the wind and leave the body, you know? So it becomes a moment where you're like, okay, this is it. You are watching the grandest show of them all. You know, there is no greater movie than one's life. That is their, all, that's the greatest ultimate film. It's a film where the whole cosmos is through your eyes watching. You know, behind our eyes, there's, um, I mean, I don't want to make this too fruity, but there is, there is, there is intelligence beyond uh, the language threshold. There is intelligence, there, there is, um, whether we call it extraterrestrial, God, the invisible other, um, the inner or the logos, whatever, like whatever you want to call it, there is something here that in its ultimate moment of honesty to self no longer deludes itself. So you will reach a moment where you will stop. Uh, once you realize your own value as a being, you'll stop creating stress for yourself. And you, you literally, your mind, it becomes hard. It becomes kind of impossible to accept that you are just a thought in a moment. You know, which uh, like a lot of uh, stress is uh, usually the person is uh, something, I, I call it a loop in the inner realms. You become stressed because you feel you cannot change. You feel you cannot change because you have thought change to be complex. You think change to be complex because in the movement of that complexity, in, in the movement of that change uh, throughout life, you at some point realize you could do nothing else but to be simple. There is moments, there is, you know, not, not all human beings, their egos are welcomed in, by, in the world, you know? The moment you can notice, you can notice sometimes it's, um, we're all tourists on a giant bus ride. Now, we don't know how the bus ride began, we don't know how it will end, but we're in the bus ride and we're wondering, what do we do? Eight billion uh, homo sapiens, eight billion creatures on a pebble in, in a light beam that we call Earth. I find that it's the cosmic landscape is designed in such a strange way that we cannot ask the big questions. <clears throat> so we cannot know where truth began and we cannot know how truth will end. But we know that while we are alive, there is free will. And what is free will but an artist of its own expression? You see, tell me this, when you, when you as a person do, you know, regular tasks, you know, not, ev not every person on the planet is Superman, you know, so many people, their days are going by doing living simple lives, simple tasks, you know, moment to moment. There are, there are moments where you get instant feedback. I call these instant successes and instant failures. They are like, okay, I don't want to say they're like just a neuro, neuro, neurological kind of uh, phenomena, but I want to say that subjectively it's like, even though neurons are moving in my brain right now, but those neurons are simultaneously being this conscious free will of a person in, in, in some manifest intelligent moment of being, you know? They, the cer certain sages in ancient times acknowledged literally like there was no instruction to life. There were just certain things that the, a person should be grateful for. And it's like, it's as if like the perfect p piano keys of the life begin being hit. That there is, uh, you have a mind as a being. And what this mind is, is an unidentified subject. <laughs> Like, you know, like we have unidentified objects, but the mind is some unidentified subject. It's like, yeah, I could, I could visualize like, a, uh, let, me, let me create something here. Like I, I can, right now I'm like in this room I am, I can visualize, for example, uh, the outlines of a golden cube just spinning. Like I can visualize that. Now, if I ask myself, where is that golden cube? Even though beyond, like I, when I'm looking at the moment and when, how my experience occurs in the room, my, it's as if like my imagination is a lens in front of 
objective reality. Now that lens, I also call it, it's like as if you're in a, it's your imagination is the room, uh, it's really your solitude. It's really the, the true solitude of your being confronting the vastness of all phenomena. I remember um, I was blessed enough to find uh, an opportunity to go to port giant pictures on the wall. And I thought how fascinating the emperor walked every day with giant images of himself and his ancestors. So it's as if the, it's, and, the, and, the, and the way the palace was built, it was as if it was built huge with space, incredible amount of space. And I realized really, it, it's as if like the emperor, <laughs> like, the, like the king of that time was like, okay, I'm feeling pretty big about myself, you know? You know, he, like he, you know, it was a sort of ego boost to walk with giants, you can say. Uh, <laughs> so I remember kind of acknowledging how interesting and what if that king, rather than having those things drawn on the wall, could just acknowledge. And what is, what is that experience of walking with giants? When you see something more than your reality, your reality automatically changes. The new is always our update. And what, what it comes down to truly, you know, if I was to speak to um, a strong-hearted audience, we are moments of attention in the, more, in the void that due to our effort and intentions, bring about the world, simply said. We are the creators uh, of the value systems that we judge the world through. So this ultimate realization means it's a state-oriented thing. So I found how fascinating that we have states in a political sense, but we also have states of a substance. For example, a liquid state, a gas state, and, and you know, a solid state. So I, so I was thinking about this, and I'm like, it's as if, imagine a civilization that changed states. So what it is, is really the, the downfall in any sort of political system is that the political system can never be up to date as much as its most up to date citizen. Do you know? So right now, the political system is like, all right, let's choose somebody to choose and not realizing we have 8 billion human beings. We have 8 billion human beings on this planet. And our political systems are, uh, in some sense, uh, individuals. It's as if then why are all the people here if one person is meant to manage everything? Do you see what I mean? The nation, it's, it's the downfall. It's like sometimes you can never point fingers at the governing power. Never. Do you know? You, because on some level, it's the responsibility of the citizen to liberate its, speech, uh, its civilization. And that's kind of what I mean by holding the hand of lost worlds. That means certain, certain, um, Certain pillars of civilization that regardless of the archetype entertained is like you must protect You must defend the only civilization you have And so the efforts of human beings can be all human beings on this planet in regards to from the civilization's eyes Could be considered as those who see it and those who don't those who see the greater presence of humanity 
And I'm not just saying this for inspiration. I'm just saying this because for eons we have been, it's like civilization took a downfall. The moment technology did what we had to do for ourselves, we sat back and then became kind of, you know, philosophy can make a person, of course, a bit lazy. <laughs> they have more doubt to every act. <laughs> But really, it's um, every moment is an artwork to be acknowledged, an artwork in the making. And really, you, you won't get a feeling uh, that civilization has to be welcoming. The overall view of it, that story of humanity that we tell our grandkids, that needs to be a welcoming system. But systems are not welcoming because the only way they're doing it is financial. And so it's really hard. It's really hard that we, are, we have really dug deep as if we've really drilled in kind of the ground uh, economically. Do you know? That means currency is, is the center of our at least uh, uh, social lives. So, so what I'm saying is, is, is kind of like what is the wonder of what if or what else? When will the moment realize that its lack of contentment is its inspiration. Just like a person who, if you're, imagine you're sitting in a room, you know, it's like it's the easiest way to find the true self, guys. <laughs> this is how you find the, the most ultimate real self, you know. When you're in a room, imagine, no thoughts, no ideas, nothing, you're alone in a room, and the temperature of the room gets cold. And you want to just get up from the room and you get up and you go and you change it. So that moment when it got so cold that you were like, okay, I'm going to do something about it. That's your real self. That's the unhindered kind of pure attention leading to external effort. There was this, I'm going to create a story here to kind of prove a point. <laughs> there was this, uh, let's say, there was this um, martial art master, let's say, here, I'll make it this kind of story. Imagine a bunch of martial art masters, they train together the heads of like great, great martial art dojos, you know, and they're three close friends. Now, as they fight these three, suddenly one of them always is undefeated. And the other two, even though they are high caliber, even though they are above, uh, they are, they are more skilled than any person in like that territory, you know, but the, they felt like, how is it that this man is, everything he does is perfect. Every movement, every touch, every his stamina, his effort, everything is perfect. These these two martial artists, even though they're all friends, they just, it's as if like imagine suddenly one of your friends changes, one of your uh, friends that you were childhood friends with, suddenly that person changes completely, you know. So these two martial artists uh, look at this third one that's undefeated, and eventually they reach a point where they give up. And they're like, we got to go and ask uh, directly. We, they can't know. They can't figure it out. And they say, and let me say it like this. Imagine like just, I mean, we can't talk about martial artists without fighting, you know. <laughs> These three martial artists, suddenly they're like, okay, let's give it one more try and see if this guy's truly undefeatable. And these two great martial artists fight this third one that's undefeated. And the third one's welcoming. He's always smiling. And in that moment, this great epic battle occurs. And it's as if those two are suddenly getting tired after like 20 minutes of constant fighting. Do you know? And still, this one is at peace. It's as if the mind of this third... A martial artist was not disturbed at all as if he was reading the newspaper that's how he was fighting them you know and uh, <laughs> and so the two ask him eventually they bow and they're they're like this is incredible and they ask him how is it how is it that uh 
you are perfect and we are imperfect. The martial artist says, because imperfection doesn't exist for me. Because, it, I don't know how to say it, it's like rather than a movement of imperfection to perfection, which is the average Joe, which it's like, it's after certain points of experiential cultivation, it just becomes perfection and imperfection. It's like, where else? Can perfection live other than in the moment? You know, it's like that's when you would start enjoying good food. You know? <laughs> we can say the mind uh, is like a camera that can zoom in and out. And when you zoom out, you dream, as Carl Jung says. When you zoom in, you uh, awaken. And what do you awaken to? That means I, I really looked at yoga and uh, like uh, since my childhood, you know, my, I had an aunt in Germany who she would always bring puzzles for me, you know. So as a kid, I was like, these puzzles were like taunting me. I'm like, okay, how, how, how is it not possible to solve this at all? You know, so I would, I would have this kind of obsession with kind of trying to like figure out this kind of puzzle. You know, even when they, it was Rubik's Cube for the first time I saw it, it was like, you know, it, it wasn't even healthy how much I was trying it. You know, it's at some point it didn't even make sense. It was like I was just endlessly moving, like the, <laughs> the, just endlessly trying different ways to solve this Rubik's Cube. Until I realized there was an algorithm. I remember on my own, I solved it until where there was two. So, um, on some level, I consider I've never solved the Rubik's Cube on my own. I only got to a random outcome of only two pieces not being in the proper place and all of them being there. But uh, aside from that, it's as if like one even it's like how people solve it is with an algorithm. And if you just memorize the algorithm, you uh, make it your own and eventually you commit it to memory. And so every time your hand it just gets Rubik's Cube, you can make it, you know. So, so like, um, anyways, anyways, what I'm trying to say is that like there was a problem to solve. And so <clears throat> I don't know, but it, it's like after some point, every moment of my life, I realize it's like, okay, let's say I had the greatest problem. Let's say I had the greatest answer. Where am I experiencing all of these? And the answer, like like a bell ringing, was like moment, 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 moment. <laughs> just I realized the just the presence of the moment, because really, when you really take in nature, it's not just like ah oh, trees, you know, butterflies, you know, rivers. Yeah, it's that's not nature. Nature is a vastness. It's it's like the Niagara Falls when you see it first time as a kid. It's, it's this incredible vastness of manifestation that me and you are on, a, like, just thinking about the solar system makes me feel we are living in the strangest place ever. It's like this is the pure definition of strangeness, the cosmic landscape. A book I'm working on, hopefully it'll be out soon, it's called God Like Spheres. <laughs> you know? And I was like, what? It's like, I've thought like, okay, it's hilarious. Kind of like imagine a religious kid kind of getting introduced to science and being like, God, why spheres though? You know, why not cubes, you know? Now, of course, science has answers for this. And um, science is not only incredible, but it is really the caretaker of humanity, one of the great caretakers of humanity, the scientific endeavor. On some level, you're like, okay, you know, AI can appear and super intelligence may potentially lead to some sort of man-made disaster. But it's like, let's at least see what it looks like. <laughs> Can you imagine, can you imagine like a, a warrior in a battlefield and they're like, why are you, why are you so intensely fighting? And even though you win, but why are you fighting so intensely? It's like, I just want us to know what it feels like. 
<laughs> like the guy didn't care about victory or anything. He was experientially inspired. Really, when you get an experiential inspiration, follow it. Your interests in life, the things that in, in life you wonder if you really had the time for, you would do, those things don't think they're there all the time. I want to tell you this. Your interests are rare moments, rare, rare moments in your life where pursue it. But at the same time, take the mentality of the observer, then action. So observe your own actions and you'll kind of, you won't lead yourself astray. That's the, that's the main thing I find. I mean, really, what else can we say? We're creatures of self-awareness. Our self is based on what we're aware of. If the person is aware of more things outside their house, then, you know, they have more to work with. Really, for me, it's all a sim symbolic adoption. That's what really language and knowledge is. We have tried to preserve uh, uh, history. Actually, all, all of knowledge can be said to be this. The preservation of history uh, in a world, inside a world I, uh, that I call the linguistic simulation language. This is why, like I remember writing this book called The Source of Language. And it was just our, it was just entries. It wasn't like a kind of book, um, like chronological book, you know. Okay. Sorry guys, I needed a quick intermission there. Life seems to be an incredible opportunity. Every day happens one uh, once and through every conscious day there's many choices, many ways that intelligence can move. And you as a human being choose on a daily basis whether your reality repeats or you attempt to walk towards the new. Do you know? That's, that's one thing I, like I, I see myself as just a guy in a universe of a billion tri trillion stars just giving some sort of commentary. But, I, but at the same time, like <clears throat> I know that there is something behind our eyes that moves what's in front of it.
it's as if the roots of our intelligence are in inconceivable dimensions. And so as much as there is so many ways, so many places you can go on earth and in this universal sector, in this cosmic sector, but at the same time, when you can close your eyes and behind your eyes fathom, you can move, you can, you can actually live uh, as your mind purely. But I don't recommend it. Civilization is, needs advanced communicators. We don't need, uh, um, it's like there's, uh, like we're going to offend trees if we all start meditating. You know, because trees are going to be like, you guys have legs, but you're still kind of sitting down. <laughs> We have to fulfill the design of human vision. And, you know, usually they, uh, the, the design is given. That's the child's mentality, the conditional dependence. Even Freud spoke about how, in, in some sense, our beginning relationships with human beings uh, dictate uh, certain psychological rhythms of our decision-making. So it's as if Freud thought God was dad, you know. And really, if you do not have an ability to observe something, you cannot control it. That means just, just, just like. I honestly don't know how to say it, guys. It's there, there. It's just sensitivity. Sensitivity brings forth detail. Detail is the addition of dimensions. Life can be seen the moment completely objectively. You see, there can be a state of thought that sees. Okay, I'm I'm a body in a room. I'm one object in a room, and there's many objects in this universe. And so I'm an object that is aware. It's an object, and so as this object that's aware of an object, I've, I started creating subjects, so I became an I, you know, an I thought, like, you know, not everybody has iPhones, but everybody has an I thought, you know, and We are this ob object that is aware of other objects, is aware of itself as an object, but also is aware that it can be a subject and others are other subjects and they have the freedom to be as, as, as uh, they have a freedom of attention as well. So if ultimately we have to realize the whole difference, really what I'm saying to audiences here, is that we have to acknowledge we're not just in one dimension of the world. We have to begin slowly acknowledging the subjective dimension and learning to handle greater, the greater realms of communication. When I say advanced communication, the era of advanced communication, what I mean is that literally we're, we as a species are going to a point where, um, how do I say it? As our, as our communication and our approach to knowledge advances, uh, in some sense evolves, pretty much our behaviors will evolve.
Okay. Um, sorry, guys. I just had to go handle something. Um, ooh. Really, um, sensitivity to our objective realm, to our subjective realm, realizing how emotions arise as the idea of you engages the energetic universe. The integration of hidden values of sight. Imagine a world where we realize only through speech, um, let's say the domains of communication, speech, writing, or any other <coughs> mediums, let's say. You can say film too. Every human being begins sharing their inner realms. We have a sort of uh, new waves of information. And like, it, I don't know what it is, but it's like, the, it's not only the body of the human being that has to work, I find. I find that the mind should work. And really the mind's work is to externalize the inner, you know? And it's not just that. I mean, life is in... <clears throat> Uh, occurs in various ways you know you can see life in a singular dimension everything is just one uh, collective occurrence or you can choose to see it as very multi-dimensional you, you know not for each their own but for each their own universe you know so we are technically in regards to our subjective realm living in a multi-universe that means everybody is looking through their own eyes first and their own eyes give an access to a view uh, to how the world seems and appears that perhaps no other eyes on the planet could see, you know. <clears throat> Life is just about uh, navigating and piloting your attention. And there are moments where you have to even step out of your inner realms. That means it's like when you're attending a gathering or something, you gotta, it's like there's no such thing as an intelligent person uh, the, uh, or a foolish person. There's just various altering states of mind. Now you can choose uh, what archetypes you entertain. You can say, um, you know, when a person speaks in public, for example, they, they have more of an in, internal responsibility to kind of hold a firm archetype, you know? But really, um, behind the scenes, that person is also sitting in the audience member, you know, as an audience member, you know. That means everything I've ever said, I've also kind of been hearing simultaneously. So you, so the, so the, uh, uh, it's like the consciousness is conscious of. Uh, it's whole, it's complete self. I believe the source of language is an experience that cannot be contained in language. 
It's an experiential reality non-dual. So do you know what that means? That means we as a species have to be like, whoa, like there are dimensions that there may never be a way for us to interpret. Or there, there is certain ways that the moment, to, uh, like I feel that after, after a certain point, we're going to get tired of calling ourselves human beings. We're just going to become moments of attention, like spheres of conscious activity, you know? And this doesn't mean this, it, it, like you're on some level, it's very crucial to be who you are and to uh, live in, uh, play your part uh, uh, in the sight of history. So what that means is on some level, you, we, on some dimension, we have to not let go of the past, you know, or who, who the person was, but to realize that the past should not occupy the space of the attention that, it, that should be to the future. That means imagine somebody comes and asks you and says, hey, man, or whoever you are, you know, it says, hey, whoever you are, <laughs> you know, the person says, um, you know, What is your worth as a being? I wonder what 8 billion human beings would say. You would see some human beings perhaps right now, they may be even in the best conditions. They may, you ask them the question and imagine they had to give their honest answer. They would suddenly say, for example, someone can feel their worth lessen if they don't abide by their own ethical constitution as a being, you know? What I'm trying to say is like, some people would have no worth, no value for themselves. Some people would have incredible value, like kings and whatnot, you know, presidents and whatnot, incredible value of self, self you know? You know, as if they're, there's archetypes that manifest that way, you know? Eventually, it's uh, if free will gets the same result, it won't feel free. So there's really two things in life that can change. Either the world changes before your, your sense of self changes, or your sense of self changes before the world changes. These are interesting implications because if the world changes before you change, these are for people who feel life is passing them by quickly. If the world changes quicker than the self, you have to wear a sweater, guys. <laughs> Excuse the noise. Um, sometimes we are where we are, you know. It's kind of like as I'm sitting here right now, if I was to explain what's occurring behind my eyes, it's like there's just a presence of attention to sensory through the eyes and the whole body, whatever the body, if the, the, the moment a person becomes still and silent, they become, a, uh, they start witnessing their, uh, what do you call it? Um, you start, your body comes back and uh, returns to its natural physical state. Uh, I don't know how to say it. Anyways, <laughs> let's say, um, okay, the world changes, the self has no choice. The self has no choice, you know, the world will change it and that's when uh, those people who are still waiting for a savior in their life, they're waiting for a break or they're waiting for a lottery ticket or something, you know?
if the self changes before the world, the self does. And if the world and the self sh change together in a sort of <clears throat> synchronized, coherent way, You remember your presence as a being and your temporary fears uh, uh, evaporate. You see, it's, it's kind of like <clears throat> right now your intelligence can be your experience uh, moving first or it can be your subjective realms moving first. The mind is a space of occurrence and everything that occurs, it's kind of like a flame where it's like, it's not the same kind of flame. It's like a constant transformation <clears throat> and anything changes. The new must be eventually adopted. That means something we're starting to realize about human psychology and human attention that it has to, in order to survive, accept the inevitable. Only then it will have a power to do something else. So the danger of human psychology is, is I don't want to say danger, but it's like you got to realize attention is the most valuable resource and what controls your attention controls what you see. Do you know what I mean? So, so your attention as a being is, it becomes, I, I say the secrets of the universe are within your attention. And if you truly take that in, you'll know what I mean. That eventually the personality is changing so much. Like if, if I asked you, are you the same person as you were 10 years ago, 20 years ago? You'd be like, no. We'd see like biologically your cells have changed completely. Now, if I ask you subjectively, now here's the chaotic thing, guys. There, there, you, the subjective realm is influenced by many things, but the attention can be kept on the past. Imagine you had a fight with someone that was unfinished and you never saw that person again. That will kind of make the attention, uh, like the, the pre attention in the present moment stuck into a fragment of its simulation. Do you know that means think of it this way, that like a healthy thought cycle is that the thought arises. You know, the th thought is around enough that the person can do something with the thought. And then afterwards, the thought leaves and new thoughts emerge. Do you know, when, when people, when I hear people say they have writer's block, I'm like, if we, ha if we wonder, do you have thought block? You'd be like, no, my mind endlessly just makes thoughts throughout the day. It, and that's why I say it's kind of like a, the mind is truly like a multidimensional antenna. It's like an antenna that in one dimension is receiving phenomena, in another dimension it's processing it. It's doing something with it. So really living has to come with trusting the effort that is your intelligence. And when you trust your inner realms, then you can ob observe your objective realm easily. That's when the scientist doesn't have to uh, worry too much about uh, their, uh, the subjective realm. But, you know, it, anything that repeats too much becomes inhuman, of course. When I say repeat, I mean like without uh, evolution. It's as if like life cannot be a snapshot photo, but many people's beliefs of what life is, is.
I remember <laughs> that um, kind of like in my youth, I had I, I was like, I don't know, maybe I was like 10 years old or something. I remember being so tired playing in the snow that I just fell back on the snow and I just lied there on the snow, like on the snow bank, you know, like I experienced what a rake would feel if it fell. <laughs> And I felt, and I felt like on the snowbank. And I remember in that moment, there was a sort of nostalgia. There is something that when your greatest effort is done, when you imagine that person in the gym who's done like the rep that's taken you to complete muscle failure, there's something there that makes you feel by expressing your whole effort, you are the new. And based on how the mind orients itself. Do you know how much of a great discovery this would be for the world that we're living in if people realize their pe people are not language. They're not what they say. They're not uh, their voices. Do you know? Their voices are like beams of the sun. Do you know of the sun that they are? So what I mean by that is being sensitive so there will suddenly be a strange civility. We'll be like, whoa, how do we get this civilized as a species? You know, where we're no, there's literally all violence rates have become to like less than 10% all over the world. Do you know? And then we suddenly see now that as, as there has been less violence, imagine, you know, less violence. There has come new innovation when people felt safe in the world. Now, this is a very hard thing. I'm not, I'm not saying that the world is safe. I'm just saying that, but, but if there came a point in our history in the future where civilization was strangely not safe, but uh, there was a freedom, that means you had a freedom to be you as a being, then you would live in that civilization, okay, that, that, that kind of so, so, uh, structure of, of the society that you find yourself in with a sort of your greatest intelligence marching through. There is no longer a boundary between this uh, uh, dishonesty, honesty, uh, unauthenticity, uh, what is it, authenticity, <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> so, so it's, it's like there's this, this social, it's like we become aware that everybody's projecting an archetype and you, everybody, like humanity relaxes. Suddenly, the play, I, I say waves of playfulness will come through an, an, an advanced civilization. The more advanced we become, actually, the more fun existence becomes. Right now, existence is suffering. Some people would say, what do you mean by fun? Could, do you mean like a virtual reality simulation where everything you want is happening in that kind, like that kind of fun, future fun? You know? <laughs> and I'll be like, no, it's, it's just... Because we're temporary creatures, we live for what we pass on, okay? This is every human being's motivation is to wonder about how they're going to march into tomorrow, right? Prepare for tomorrow. Now, to prepare for tomorrow, of course, there is like this objective mountain and, and like every person should go live their life like a fool, but they should uh, learn from it like a master. You know, <laughs> live like a fool, but uh, learn like a master, you know, and it becomes a strange thing where that way the eyes of the fool are sometimes open to the most chaotic archetypes. Do you know, the fool stumbled into a bad neighborhood. It's like, oh, oh my God, like the life lesson was immense. <laughs> the person got out of there, but the life lesson was immense, you know, and so really, I don't know what it is, but, um, I think we're clothing the truth of the world uh, in just language and it's, it will drive our species crazy. Imagine someone just eating the same kind of pudding every day. Like it would drive the guy nuts after a point. You know, every day will though, you know what I mean? Like let's say a couple times a day, the person would be like, okay, like I'm eating so much pudding, I'm becoming pudding. <laughs> But what I mean by, by that, it, it's, it's like, so, so it's, it's, it's this kind of like being aware of uh, free will is the update. That's it. Your free will is your, um, the only way out. Because the free will is the value giver. And ultimately, all values, you can look at it in such a grand scale where, of course, you can say free will doesn't exist when there's billions of trillions of stars, you know? <laughs> So it's it's one of those things where in in a, in in 
in an existence of countless stars, really, uh, language is clay. <laughs> and all human beings from all time have been playing with this clay, you know? Their knowledge has been how the efforts of their speech, you know? Like, I don't know how to say it, but it, it's, it's, it's definitely communication is a multidimensional experience. It's definitely a multidimensional experience. Any sort of extent, like how can I, it's, it's I don't know, it's, I, I feel like at least the bat made contact with the ball of the point I was trying to make, you know, <laughs> it may not be a home run, but you know, <laughs> I don't know, I, I, I feel there is a value to people's minds that the civilization is not acknowledging, honestly, this is my ultimate, like ultimate motivation. Um, now I've wondered, okay, you can't really change the past because it's already past and it's like it's too old to change, like you, you know, but at the same time, the same space, it's as if we're all in this, the, the life is this giant parking lot and different cars are coming in and they're just like having a picnic there and leaving. And it's like different lifetimes, all these human beings, they, they've just been like kind of like uh, efforts of experience on the surface of this earth. Beethoven says some next level stuff. He says, don't only practice your art, but force your way into its secrets. For it and knowledge can raise man to the divine, can raise men to the divine. So you see, it's, it's, it's like, the value of finding one's true nature is not truth. It's what you can do after you've seen it. And really the, the ultimate truth of the personal dimension is the impersonal realm. Pretty much the greatest conclusion the conscious mind makes is like, okay, there's the unconscious, you know, whatever kind of equation we, scientific equation we find to attempt to explain reality and as Paul Dirac suggested to all scientists that this equation should be beautiful so at this beautiful equation that's going to explain the whole cosmos imagine one day some scientists have big dreams so 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 these incredible kind of efforts are kind of I don't know how to say it but like It's no longer just being aware of the world we live in, but to also be conscious of the worlds that live in us. And strangely, the same way a person watches TV, if you can have that relationship with your subjective realm, then you will become observant. And after a while, you'll wonder why certain thoughts arise. And if you do nothing and just watch, watch the patterns of nature occurring as you, then you suddenly realize the higher rhythms of observance. So you become rooted into an experience of more like a presence in the moment rather than a personality with a certain history, face, and, um, you know, story. It's like, sure, stories can, can be changed. They say stories are written by uh, the vict victors. Guess what? Let me tell you something hilarious. Imagine two great empires were at war and one of them conquered the others and suddenly history was the history that that empire said always made itself the winner. Okay. <clears throat> that winner of that empire at the time wrote history, but then in that moment, the future generations were the winners and they rewrote history. 
So on some level, there's nothing to fear about communication in this world because inevitably the future uh, will change the significance. The environments will change to such a degree that it's all about what phenomenology is in your sight. So when your attention becomes your divine temple, every moment you're in the presence of the ultimate. Now this presence of the ultimate is not some glorification of a sky daddy archetype in the clouds. This, 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 this is in some sense reality. And so, of course, there's one way you can access knowledge and truth, and it's about, let's say, it's by looking at books, you know. And there's another way of attaining knowledge, which is purely experiential. You forget, it's as if you, are, you have asked a question before you learned language. It's that, that depth. So in that depth, you suddenly realize the edge of the philosopher's efforts uh, are suddenly found in the limited simulation. And really, the hardest obstacle is to, as the Buddha says, kind of like, it, it's, it's a suggestion of the enlightened mind, I, I believe it was in the Diamond Sutras, where it's as if in moving in the grassland, he moves not a single grass. That's how we, the higher, other dimensions must be navigated. That means you don't, you, don't, you don't go into your neighbor's house and act like you own the place. Do you know why don't people do that? Because they acknowledge the realm. They acknowledge reality. You know? The, the worst thing that's happening is that some of the children of the future generations are thinking that life is a bad place. It's a ridiculous opportunity after 4 billion years. It can never be bad. That means regardless of how bad you think you have it as a person, the species could have not existed. We could have been right now uh, uh, on the edge of extinction, but we're not. So we as human beings at least find ourselves in this bunker of space and time where civilization is healthy enough to continue. We are kind of wondering what next. And really it's about mistakes that must be solved. So here's the issue. We have kind of, as a species, created these, let's say, global tragedies, inevitable tragedies that think that are going to happen. For example, all the satellite debris, debris in our at atmosphere. For example, the potentials of AI. For example, um, uh, nuclear war. For example, kind of cyber uh, di disillusionment or something, you know? Uh, cyber, cyber simulations, for example. These, are, these all can be... These are all, it's as if the, the civilization has to understand that if it doesn't unite, it has no way of, in an organized way, uh, ch uh, com um, fixing the issues at hand. Do you know? That means, really, it's either now or never when we realize our own extinction is occurring due to a mess, right? And the most thing I'm most concerned about is the satellite debris the satellite debris that's in the atmosphere because if you think about it it becomes so insanely chaotic you know imagine like so many satellites in our atmosphere right now now these satellites or whatever they eventually get have particles hitting them and so when particles are hit in that kind of uh kind of orbital pathway of the satellite debris, the debris hits each other, becomes smaller pieces, smaller pieces. Eventually, it will become a, a, a prison of kind of shattered tiny pieces of satellite debris where we as a, uh, as a planet, as a species can't leave our solar, our atmosphere. We become chained to the earth, do you know? So, so there's many natural things and people have to somehow take the attention of the person to nature. So that becomes the incredible kind of responsibility of uh, not only filmmakers in the world, but just those people who are just bringing new ideas to audiences. <clears throat> if life is a story, then you pretty much the meaning of life becomes what kind of story you're telling yourself. But if life is more than a story, if it's experientially oriented, then every experience with the unknown is, is kind of like the battle scars you learn from automatically how to handle life, you know? There's some strange kind of correlation between a person's desire and karma. And... I've wondered why. Why is it that it's like there's bad karmic weather when the person has a sort of desire 
how can I say it? Like a I think desire makes you get locked down in your inner realms so you don't see what's happening outside and you automatically stumble and that's why there's karma uh, to desire. I think it's just a lack of sight because the, the mo imagine a person, imagine like <clears throat> asking Albert Einstein, you were concerned about uh, like a smudge of some sauce on your shirt and you were just wiping that, missing out on an opportunity where even Albert Einstein is just waiting for you to come and ask. So what I mean is it's like that's, that's the issue with desire. Wanting something, one specific thing in life for too long becomes strangely obsessive. It becomes impossible to attain. Do you know, this is why it's like sometimes some of those people who are holding banners of um, uh, like strength and sort of their own uh, projections of their own greatness. What really happens is that in life really shows you what, what goes on. So on some level, think of it this way. You did all the preparation you could. Now the next part is to run into the battlefield. The battlefield is not a physical one. It's not a physical war. It's ideological, uh, how ideologies have been positioned in the minds of people. And I wonder, okay, so how, how? Let's say if, let's say we're like that maverick who's like, what if civilization united, you know? So we kind of see that would mean that every individual would require to be able to see more than what they see, to care for more than just what they see. So imagine now, it's not, instead of not having a desire, having a global desire, and then having a galactic desire, and then having a universal desire. As the desires go more in the macrocosm, the archetypes become more like myth mythological levels. So what that means is we will feel like the gods of mythology walking the modern world. That's what happens to the sensitivity of the mind when it realizes it is, its experience moves its subjective realm. So that person forgets about the smudge because whoever cared and like goes and asks Einstein their question. And Einstein's like, you already know the answer, buddy. <laughs> So anyways, guys, thanks for tuning in. Um, uh, I would recommend something. I feel like I'm kind of responsible to share it after what I witnessed today uh, when I was downtown Toronto. In life, I know it is unnecessary, really, financially even, if thinking about it, to help others. It's unnecessary. But if you considered a mind that it's not a robot asking you, maybe it's, it's as if human beings would care enough to shape the streets. You know, we, you, we, we go to the downtowns of the most evolved countries only to find the lowest of the lowest. So I was thinking, what is this? That back, like the Medici family in, Re in the Renaissance, uh, during the Renaissance times, when they came into power, they were like, we will build the most beautiful cities, the most incredible streets, the place where even the lowest feel they're among the greatest. You see? So, so it becomes a totally different structure of social value. We are, we are kind of descending into a sort of savageness of our subjective realms. Think of it this way, that our, we are not physically violent to one another as human beings, but our minds are still archetypally violent, you know? So when that archetypal violence, eventually there will come a time where we will evolve beyond it. Beyond that archetypal violence, I find there is a common language of experience. So really it should be like every child is kind of told there is a hidden, there is this vision that every human being has to find. 
Do you know? The human vision, just the, just the significance of uh, the human design and its efforts. Because it's very easy to, we can, everybody's like really taking the ostrich method to suffering. They're just putting their head in the ground, not, not wanting to see really the chaos of the world. But only when you can, you're able to see the chaos, you can bring it order. That means some people wonder, how is it that in chaotic situations, that person was able to have incredible order? Because the order was more important to them than the chaos. Simply it. So I see kind of civilization as needing a quick mirror and that mirror is beyond language. It's, it's the common language of human living. It's just how like you see uh, other animals in nature, they're living. It's just the presence. We're, we're continuing a sort of um, genetical pattern. It's, it's fascinating, you know. I think it's like, can you, can you, like the, when imagine Darwin telling his like, Family, like, guys, we evolved from, like, chimpanzees. And his family's, like, that, ex that, imagine they believe Darwin, you know? And the family's, like, whoa, so we are all animals. So they, suddenly the inferiority of man's mind from legend and myth uh, kind of descended back into uh, the attention of the moment residing in fully a biological instrument. Under of the whole place is that common language that experientially orients us. That means something that, what is it that is beyond all the, uh, I don't want to say inefficient, but like, let, let's say all the uh, inferior archetypes of man's mind. It's the vision for exploration, but exploration of a bigger field. That means really societies evolve when uh, human beings feel uh, valuable in multiple dimensions of their being. And so that can only arise if not like either the world changes or the self. The mind should be seen as such a fragile and incredible instrument that um, I don't know what um. Change gets the last uh, laugh. You know, Ludwig von Beethoven, his, his last dying words on his deathbed was like, he's like, applaud my friends. The comedy is over. This, this endless effort to project a simulation of a life of meaning and to go live in the world. Eventually, it all comes down. It's like that which was born out of the void returns to the void, you know? In shamanic traditions, uh, they would have the oldest person in the family and the youngest person in the family together. And the oldest person was uh, 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 returning to the spiritual realm and the youngest person had, was, had just uh, stepped out of the uh, spiritual realm, you know? And so it's imagine the oldest and youngest person, one is returning and the other is in some sense, it's like they're both instruments of each other's fascination. So you see humanity is very much more deeper. Every behavior you know, every emotion you know, imagine infinite par parallel potentials of those. Reality is an incredible place and we are as, as a species slowly awakening to the fact that there's this conscious witness. This conscious witness is the navigator of life. Once you realize you're it, you'll laugh at every truth you've ever heard. You will also cry, but you will laugh, you know, ultimately. Because it continues. And a being who is convinced through their inner realm of their own experiential continuity has a strange archetypal in access that a being who avoids what is here does not attain. 
so anyways guys thanks for tuning in and um help the world and think of it this way like as re imagine you're driving and you suddenly see like an eagle just on the side of the highway and you kind of like strangely make eye contact with the eagle a distant eye contact <laughs> And so it's like it's a rare occurrence. And think of when life comes towards you, it's a rare occurrence. You know, this means not only looking at life through the lens of caution and, and through the dimensions of alertness, but also in regards to the value and significance and meaning and what, where really the momentum of the moment is going or even if it needs to go somewhere. You know, I have spoken to people that it's like they believe life can be made so complex that it's like it's, it makes you no longer kind of like the, the problem can never have an answer. And some people say just living simply is the answer. So there's, there's many dynamics, but the ultimate motivation has to come with who we as human beings realizing it's just about your eyes have opened, become aware of where you are. Your eyes have opened, you are in a world, okay, become aware of the laws and meaning and the structure of this world, but also become aware of how it, it, there's a sort of subjective phenomenology simultaneously occurring as objective phenomenology is occurring. You know, so consciousness seems to uh, have a hidden, hidden, uh, hidden side, you know, a hidden um, uh, self, you know, a, a hidden dimension to it. Our civilization now has forgotten the value of exploring really, uh, edu how can I tell you, it's, um, <sighs> there's potential but it's not being utilized, you know. Sometimes it's much harder to leave this world when you saw what it could be, you know. Anyways, guys, thanks for tuning in. Much blessings and no sin. And un an unforgettable humanity awaits. Yeah. It's a good thing to say at the end. <laughs>